Welcome to In This Corner with Cyrus Fees. I am Cyrus Fees. On this episode, we have two mega stars that I'm very excited about. We are going to have Chris Cyborg in the house, and we're going to kick it off by going out to Las Vegas and talking to this man, a 19-year MMA veteran, currently with a record of 19 and 13, two-time UFC champion, most subs by a heavyweight, third most subs in UFC history, tied for most fights in UFC history, uh, does color commentary for ACA, uh, also, he did the WEC, even done a little pro wrestling and some stand-up comedy. It has to be Frank Mir. Frank, how are you, man? I'm doing really well, Cyrus. How's it been, man? You know, it's, uh, it's been a pandemic. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Right. Same as everybody else. <laughs> yes, normal things for a pandemic, I guess. Um, how, how's everything been in Las Vegas? Um, obviously, we're kind of on the second surge of things as we do this interview. Uh, we did that right. initial surge, things calmed down, now things are kind of going a little crazy again. How, how is it out in Vegas? Yeah, I think uh, pretty much the same. It is everywhere. Uh, I think that the, uh, you know, the first, um, you know, lockdown worked. Uh, you know, our, our levels are real low. And, um, uh, and you know, the hospitals were barely filled up. Um, and then maybe now we've gone too much the other way because now I'm hearing that, you know, there's places where it's over full. And, you know, I understand that was what the whole idea was to, uh, you know, to flatten the curve. So hopefully, you know, we, uh, sorry, my son didn't realize that I'm on the phone. <laughs> That's all right, dude. He just grabbed me, handed me dogs and stuff. Uh, <laughs> So anyways, father, uh, anyway, yeah. um, and so now it's starting to go the other way again, where, you know, things are starting to take steps backwards. I, uh, I have a lot of friends, obviously, in the entertainment industry, as far as, uh, you know, in hospitality, you know, bartenders and hosts and, and, uh, you know, it, it's really, you know, it's hurting them bad, you know? Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, there are some people that I'm, <laughs> You know, my sons are friends with that are on the lower end that are kind of enjoying it, I guess, because, you know, they're making more on unemployment than they did, oh, yeah. you know, plus the tables. But, but uh, for mostly adults, this is, you know, not great financially. But, you know, I've done what uh, I think the, I made great out of the situation. Um, you know, since we came back in March, you know, because obviously – Going and lifting in gyms, we were able to keep a much smaller group. Uh, yep. I basically just trained with my daughter and my sons and, um, you know, Nick Best and I and Steve Dotti and just constantly kept small groups and just lifted weights and, you know, spent a lot of time with the family. And now that it's been opening up, we've been able to get back in and rolling around and sparring. But, uh, you know, now it looks like it might get that get shut down again. So, I, I don't yeah. know. Maybe, uh, you know, you know, I think that I'm learning like everybody else how to deal with the new world that it's going to be in. So, just, uh, you know, having to make adjustments for training and, and, and figuring out a way around it instead of just, you know, I, I've never been the person to sit around and just complain about, you know, stuff yeah. and go, oh, well, this sucks. It's like, all right, well, that's just how it is. It's figure out what to do with it you know exactly you kind of have to adjust and and figure it out you're right i mean that goes for making money and doing anything you know you just have to adjust uh and i'm glad you're getting time to spend with the family because i know you uh for you know the time that i've known you you know just jet setting and doing all these shows and all over the world and uh now you ha you're forced to be grounded so it's all that extra time with the family and that is a very valuable time to say the least yeah no i've really enjoyed it it's funny because uh you know uh, you always hear these horror stories now. People like, you know, wanting to get divorce rates or through the roof, domestic <laughs> violence. Yeah. I'm like, I, I like my family. I, I like being home. So uh, it's been you. a bonus. <laughs> Maybe I'm the one they don't like, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like everybody doesn't know, like, hey, like you, you have in your group. And if you don't think it's, you have one, then you're the <laughs> Maybe you're that me. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, man, you know, obviously the fight game has continued to roll on, at least for the UFC and some other organizations. Uh, what do you make of that? Just the whole approach. And uh, obviously the UFC's held, what, I don't know, seven, eight events now at this point. Now they're on Fight Island doing shows uh, at the time of this recording. Uh, what do you make of that, man, that the fight game has been one of the sports that's been able to continue, which you would think the nature of the beast, that it would probably be one of the last because all the there's no social distancing involved. It's the exact opposite. Well, actually, I thought that it was a great idea when it first came out. I talked about our phone booth fighting. Richard was a little, uh, you know, he didn't know whether he wanted to, you know, he was for it or against it, if I remember correctly. And, you know, yeah. it was just cautiously watching. And I, I thought it was a great idea. Obviously, you know, you know, you can't be paralyzed by perfection. A lot of guys do that when they put together tests or, you know, or formats or planning for a strategy. Like, well, there's a flaw here. I'm all, dude, there's been never a perfect plan, plan ever created by man. 
Sure. Uh, there's flaws in everything we do, but we got to try to look and improve and move forward. So I thought uh, the UFC opening up and, and doing shows, uh, it made sense to me because it's like, all right, here's a situation where you can have uh, stringent testing on a small group of people, the fighter, the cornerman, the commission, you know, and the production crew. You know, you could do a fight with, you know, and, and have, you know, such a few amount of people that you can really reduce the risk. Is it perfect? Well, no. Our lockdowns aren't perfect. No. You know, I mean, even in Vegas, when we were locked down, I could still drive to Taco Bell, still could go to <laughs> Walmart. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you're telling me the kid working behind the counter at Taco Bell, you're trusting him with your physical health that he's not going to have a little bit of a cold and show up at work anyways. Sure. Or you see what I mean? Like, so to me, there was never, you know, a perfect plan, but I get it. It's like a, it's like seatbelts, airbags. They're not perfect, but they definitely improve the chances I'm going to do well. And yeah. so I thought that, uh, that, MMA actually made sense because it took the fewest amount of people to have a competition and, sure. and, and air it, you know, obviously a live audience in any capacity is hard to, to uh, pull off right now, but uh, you know, putting on a football or a soccer match, you know, it just so many more people are involved with it. I can see how it'd be more difficult to do. And uh, yeah. with the fights, I mean, hell, hell I mean, we don't, you know, the team is one guy and three cornermen, you know, so, you sure. know, uh, versus one guy and three cornermen it's a, a much smaller group. And, and because of that, I thought it was actually a smart move to take advantage of what they had logistically uh, an advantage over other sports. Yeah. You know, I think it, relatively it's gone smooth. I mean, uh, to be yeah. honest, you know, a little few hiccups, few lost fights. And, uh, but for the most part, I think it's gone really well. I, I know the guys are dealing with a lot, having to get tested nonstop, you know, and uh, being away from their family for even more time than usual. But uh I think it has. I think it has gone very, very well. And, and I'm very happy for all the fighters to be able to stay busy, uh, which is an amazing thing because a lot of fighters, they have to stay busy to make money. Um, so mm -hmm. definitely happy for that. Um, well, let's, let's take it back just a little bit and then we'll kind of get to the present here. Go back. Vegas born and bred, man. Uh, born and raised in Las Vegas. What's that like? I always ask people that and you always get the conception that everybody's hanging out on the strip. But in reality, it's a whole different world there uh, when you live there. What was it like uh, growing up in Vegas? I think that you actually, you know, you're surrounded by luxury. You get to see the excesses that everybody doesn't really get at home and they come to Vegas. And uh, I really get to see people's true nature. I think that's what made me very much of a student of human behavior because, uh, you know, it's amazing when you give people freedom, you really get to see who they are, you know, and, you know, you get to be people with <laughs> personality. So, Sure. Um, if anything, it actually helped me kind of keep more of my composure uh, in dealing with things and realizing like, all right, you know, th that might be fun right now, but there'll be a price to pay tomorrow. And it's, if it's worth it, have fun. If it's not, you might want to rethink your actions. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, I got to ask you, you know, with it being the fight cap, but obviously so much boxing there back in the day, well, have you always been a fan of the fights and a fan of boxing and, and all that? Was that something you always kind of gravitated towards or did you just kind of go into the fights separately from that? No, actually, because my father coming from Cuba, you know, Cuba has a strong uh, of course. background in, uh, you know, in international and in amateur boxing. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I've always had an interest in that. And then, so I grew up watching like everybody else, uh, you know, very interesting. You know, I mean, hell, I was a kid during the, you know, you know, the yeah. late 80s and 90s and stuff when, you know, boxing really, you know, with Mike Tyson was king. Especially and, the heavyweight yeah, yeah, man, yeah. awesome back then, yeah. Yeah, and then even as I got older, you know, I was always a huge fan of uh, Roy Jones Jr., you know, and then watching different guys go through. So, you know, I've gotten to be, uh, you know, watch fights here in town, you know, you see Kodos and, and versus the Margarito, you know, like I've been part of some, uh, you know, uh, spectacular events and I've always been a huge fan of boxing. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love boxing and, and there's definitely some pageantry to it. Obviously it's lost a little bit of steam here in the last decade or so. It doesn't quite carry the same weight. Uh, that it used to but I got a sidebar for a second because as we record this they just announced that Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson are going to fight uh, in an exhibition uh, yeah what do you make of something like that uh, obviously I mean just last weekend as we record this in Iowa which is where this is going to be airing initially uh, Pat Militich and Michael Nunn just fought in an exhibition uh, so what do you make of the guys that are in the twilight, and I'm not going to say you're there yet, because, you know what I'm saying, but these guys were in their 50s, you know what I mean, uh, still throwing down. What do you make of that? I think that, uh, you know what, I think we're pushing abilities of what humans are able to do, and we understand better. And I think it's just like it was back in the 50s when, you know, no one had ran a four-minute mile, sub four. 
And, and once the, uh, the guy, I think at 58, broke it, all of a sudden the next year, you know, it wouldn't have, I think it got you seventh place just to barely break uh, the four-minute yeah. mile. Uh, I, I think people, you know, we kind of always, as humans, and I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's an evolutionary trait, we want to watch someone else go first. And if I see someone else eat the berry yeah. and survive, then, then we all feel comfortable eating and partaking of the berry, right? And so I think that right now, you know, you know, 30 years ago, you're talking about a boxer or a fighter in his 30s, and that was unheard of. You're like, no, there's no way. You're past your prime. You know, I remember as a kid hearing stories that Muhammad Ali was old. And now I look back, and when they said he was old, <laughs> he was 32. I'm all, that was <laughs> old. But, yeah. I mean, also then, you, you know, you didn't have quarterbacks in the NFL competing at 41, 42 years of age at the top of their game, you know? And so I think with nutrition and training and understanding that like, Hey, look, the human body is capable of a lot more than what we think it is um, that we've given credit for in the past. It's whether you have the drive to do it or not. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. And I think there's definitely a place for it. Obviously you keep these guys as safe as you can, but you're right, man. Medi the medical field has gone a long way and guys can keep going at a pretty high level uh, you know, into their fifties. It's pretty amazing, really. Um, so that'll be, that'll be something to watch anyways. Um, let's go back here. You were an all sports star, man. You were a jock. You were doing everything right. So I, I kind of look on, I look on the Wikipedia and you and I have never talked about this, but what was the sport that you really loved uh, back in high school and all that? Was it, was it football? Cause I know you were full back doing all that. What was the sport that really got you or was it wrestling? Uh, you know, I, I liked wrestling, but I didn't get exposed to it until my junior year of high school. Uh, I, I played football from a freshman year, and I really liked uh, – I really did love football. And that's why my kids play it now, and I, and I totally understand that they're enamored with it. Uh, and But sure. uh, but I, I've always just had a special place in my mind for, you know, martial arts. You know, I grew up watching, you know, my dad, you know, showing Bruce Lee movies and Chuck Norris. And, yeah. and then, you know, as I was a kid, you know, watching Bloodsport and Kickboxer or, or you know, uh, or uh, uh, Hard to Kill with Steven Seagal and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, I always, you know, I really enjoyed those sports and I enjoy all sports. I, I love competing. Um, there was just nothing that ever fulfilled the same, you know, uh, satisfaction, same, you know, drive as just competing and fighting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you meet up with, with Joe Silva eventually, and um, at least that's what they got on Wikipedia. I want to make sure that we get that right. But you, you end up, you know, kind of getting into the sport a little bit, into MMA. Give me a story about those early days, because I've asked a lot of folks that I've had here um, interviews uh, asking about the early days and just kind of the Wild West and the, the wild stuff that you see in some of these small shows. Can you give me a good story from back in the day? Because I think you did hook and shoot. Which yeah, was, that was my first fight. Yeah. Uh, my first professional fight, I never had an amateur career. I, uh, I did an amateur boxing match. And then yeah. uh, I wanted to do more of those, but it was just, as a heavyweight, they're just not easy to find. Of course. And then the yeah. same thing, MMA was just not easy. So I turned professional uh, right off the bat. And, and you went so into the off. UFC fairly quickly, too. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, so, I think yeah, my yeah, first professional been... fight was uh, June, I think. And then my first UFC fight was that September, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think the thing that, you know, when people ask me like, Hey, any kind of crazy stories? I'm like, eh, you know, hook and shoot was interesting because uh, you know, we all, you know, they had us all down in the basement of this like church that we were fighting in <laughs> and, um, and nothing too nuts, but just, I remember being disgusted by the fact that we were all kind of like rotating the gloves, you know, they oh. had like about 20 <laughs> fights that night, but they didn't have 40 sets of gloves. They not had probably, I think, about six to eight. And so as <laughs> number one was done fighting, he was giving his gloves to fight number oh, yeah. four or five and, and rotating through. So and I was, as, even though it was my debut, being a heavyweight, they put me later in the card uh, just before I think Aaron Riley was fighting. And so, uh, you know, by the time I got the gloves, they were so soaked with, uh, and I told <laughs> myself it was water. But obviously, I knew that it was a lot of sweat from uh, by about 15 other people that I had to put my hands. And you into. were you were in the main event? Uh, towards the end, that wasn't towards the, the end. Event. Okay, that's yeah. pretty good for your first pro fight. That's not bad. Yeah. Heavyweights, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I Probably love I love watching heavyweights, man. Everybody <laughs> wants to watch heavyweights. Um, I'm a big proponent of of heavyweight MMA, heavyweight boxing. Just seems like the bigger the fighter is, that's what folks want to see, man. It doesn't matter what the fight even looks like half the time. They just want to see the biggest and the baddest guys fight. You kind of believe in that as well? You kind of have that feeling about it as well? Well, no, and I understand that because, 
you know, you sit there and go, okay, I'm, I'm the baddest guy at 145. And I guess people at home, they kind of sit there and go, well, what happens about the average badass that's 200 pounds? Yeah. That would be a pretty, you know, and, and there is some truth to it because that's why there's weight classes. If, if the 145 pound guy could compete against a heavyweight, there would just be an open class. So we wouldn't have to yeah. worry about dividing guys up. I actually do find though, all the weight classes interesting. And typically because, you know, look, five minute rounds and heavyweights, their activity is just not as high because of, you know, they're more powerful, more explosive. They can be quick, but as far as, uh, you know, the ability to keep doing endurance, it's much more difficult. So watching the bantam weights and the welterweights or, you know, the lightweight guys, I, I find really interesting, uh, to, uh, to, to, to partake in and to watch because, you know, I get to see a guy, you know, maneuver more often. Yeah. And so you get more quantity and same quality in a fight. Whereas in a wrestling match or, you know, a fight with heavyweights, you're just going to see less yeah. just because they're not capable of it. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously you've called a lot of fights and, and, and I know you do enjoy calling every weight class and, uh, and you get a lot out of everything. And, and I do too with commentary. It's a lot of fun with all the weight classes, but I always get just a little bit more turned up when the heavyweights come through. Um, that being said, you know, it's interesting with your career, Frank, because you obviously, you kind of went through three eras, in my opinion. That golden era of the UFC, I mean, you were in there against Tank Abbott. You know what I mean? Like, he was a part of that original crop uh, of heavyweights that everybody knows, you know, back when it was still banned in certain states, et cetera, et cetera. You kind of get over it to what I call the tough era, uh, the ultimate fighter era, where everything kind of blew up, you know, around uh, 05, 06, when things just kind of went nuts. And then now you're in this era, this modern era, which is even more different uh, in my estimation. Um, talk about the difference between some of those eras and what do you think the biggest difference is from now to kind of when you started and when things were really going hard back there in the mid 2000s? Well, I think that, you know, when I first started out, people were still learning the sport. I mean, it was so relatively new. Uh, I mean, you had a lot of coaches. I mean, almost every single coach that uh, was, was back then had never even had a fight himself. They were yeah. guys that were either kickboxers and, or wrestlers or boxers, uh, jujitsu experts, you know, some background in martial arts. So they had a field of expertise that they were trying to apply towards MMA and, and be a, a coach uh, and help out. We didn't have that many guys that actually had done it and, and were successful at all ranges that were capable of knocking someone out capable of, of, of winning a fight with wrestling, capable of winning a fight through submission, and then coaching. And then maybe you have your specialist coaches that can really yeah. clean up certain aspects of your game. But you, we didn't really have, in my opinion, there was no great head coaches back then because, I mean, honestly, like how is a coach who's never been punched in the face going to talk to you really and understand? I mean, I get it. They understand to a point, but they're still, you know, even the, you know, football coaches in the NFL all have some experience. Now they not might necessarily have the physical talent yeah. or, you know, or the opportunities to have been a professional themselves, but they have an experience with it. So they, when they're, they're speaking, they have some exposure. And then from the instructional point of the outside can explain what's going on, speaking, talking, there's just an element of just, if you haven't been in there, you just don't know. I mean, it's incapable of knowing. That would be, you know, hopefully the, this is a, uh, a PG-13 oh, no, and up group. You're right? good, dude. You're but, good. you know, it, I don't care how much you study sex. And you might understand it very well. <laughs> you might be able to explain it and be a good psychologist on it. But you really have never had it. You're going to have a heart. You know, there's always going to be that element missing. You know what I mean? I'm not saying sure. that, you know, that you have to yeah. be good at it to be a good teacher of it, but you, <laughs> you've never done it. Now you're going to coach me upon it. Eh, I just don't see that happening. How am I not surprised we pivoted there? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I've spent enough time with you, Frank. Um, that, that being said, you know, man, so many big moments and we could walk through them all. But, you know, when I, when I put on that I was going to be interviewing you, two things always come up, you know, when, when it comes to your name, it's, it's arm breaks breaking people's arms, uh, which you've done twice uh, in a very big way. 
Uh, funny thing, we just had Tim Sylvie on. He was the last interview that we did on this show. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he's still having, you know, issues with that arm to this day, which is crazy. Uh, but then, of course, Nagara as well. And then the other thing they bring up, of course, is the motorcycle accident. And everybody kind of goes back to that. But let's, let's start with the arms, man. Obviously, you, you, you beat Tim Sylvia to win the title, but you do it in such an impactful way by breaking his arm, such a, a brutal way. Um, kind of walk me through the whole thing, man. And, and I just kind of want to know, because it's probably something I'm never going to do in my life, busting somebody's arm. Do you know when it's about to happen? Do you kind of get that feeling like, all right, this thing's about to go, or, or does it just happen? Like, kind of, kind of get in my head. Let me get into your head. Yeah, right. um, I, the best way I've always explained it over the years to people is same. You know, uh, uh, a twig, a tree branch, and, and a, an arm or a bone actually are extremely similar. You know, they have bend on it. You know, your bones aren't brittle, and but they only have so much bend before they give and they snap. So you'll feel that when you're you're pulling on someone's arm or cranking on a leg you'll feel the bone bowing yeah. bending and then all of a sudden it doesn't want to bend anymore and just before when it stops bending that that flex is taken out that's when i know the snap's about to happen as i apply more pressure wow you know and it it's so crazy because you, you would imagine that you're just you're in the mode you're in the fights and and it happens like that but do you almost, is it like a kill or be killed thing? Or is it like, you kind of like, all right, dude, it's like, all right, I'm just going to have to break this thing. You know what I mean? Like, is, is that even going through your head? Or are you just in the throes of the fight and all emotions taken over and all, or do you kind of think in the back of your mind, all right, dude, I'm going to have to bust this arm real quick. Yeah, no, there's really not that kind of cognitive thought process. Behind yeah, it. I figured, right? Yeah. Well, just because that's not how I've trained myself. Yeah. You know, when I train to do a maneuver, whether I'm throwing a punch, I'm trying to go through. I tell people like this, if you practice a three punch combination, you practice for the three punches to do what they're supposed to do. Whether one is a distance punch, a range, one's a, uh, you know, a distraction and the other one is setting up another, you know, one might just be meant for loading. You know, there's different uh, things that each punch might be trying to accomplish but there's a system to it that you are flowing through and you yes. train it in its entirety but if all of a sudden i'm going through the combination and you fall down well all of a sudden then doom whatever happens like well i didn't expect you to drop with the straight but the cross was coming but ah, you fell down i'll cease and desist but uh sure. the intent was to finish you with it so that's how same process i think when i grab a limb you know i, I mean what other I, I've never tried to sit there and play uncle with people. I'm not sitting there going, hey, pain compliance. Sure. I'm not yeah. trying to. In my mind, when I lock up a submission, it is to disabilitate you so that I can get to your throat. You know, because I've trained martial arts, you know, primarily was to learn self-defense. And so I thought, oh, if I break your arm, that means you have one less arm to protect your throat. And ultimately, yeah. I want to choke you unconscious because that's the greatest way to incapacitate you, you know, from being able to fight or do any further damage to me. And so if you tap before that, to me, it's like, oh, okay, the fight's over with before I got to have to finish you. Um, you know, it'd be like me hitting you with a shot. And before I knock you out, the referee comes over and goes, he's done. Okay, cool. I didn't train to bring the referee yeah. over. I trained to put you to sleep. But if yeah. they stop it before that, hey, you know, it's sport. You feel bad? Do you, do you feel bad after it happened? No. I mean, t is it one of those things? I mean, obviously, it seems like after every fight, and I might be wrong with this because there's obviously special situations where you might just not like a guy at all. But a lot of times you see these guys, any two guys have a fight, and they're usually kind of bonded for the rest of their lives after that point. And there's a, kind of a friendship and kind of a bond because you guys went to war inside of a cage. Um, did you feel bad about either one of those? No, I've actually felt worse about knockout shots because okay. those are harder to uh, adjust. You can't really sit there and go, okay, I'm done. You're about to knock me out. With, with a submission, I guess the reason why I've never felt bad is I always feel like, hey, the onus is on you. If you don't want to have your limb broken, super easy. All you have to do is scream, tell the yeah. referee, tap. You tap out and it's over with. So yeah. really, like to me, it's like, I'll feel bad for the situation, but I don't have any remorse on my end because I'm like, well, you know, I mean, like, it'd be like if uh, we were playing football and you're hitting the hole and I'm hitting the hole, you lower your head because you want to score on that one yard line. Well, if I knock the living daylights out of you, I don't feel bad you got knocked out. It's like, well, you didn't have yeah. to lower your shoulder and try to score. 
I did my job. You chose sure. to do yours. You could have slid, you know, if you were a quarterback. I'm like, hey, slide. There's a way out of this. I don't have to take your head off. <laughs> this is Go ahead and scoot on your butt and slide. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you want to stay on your feet, I'm going to try to take you out. <laughs> there it is. There it is. That's, that's the best way to answer that question. Um, you know, my biggest memory, you know, being as a fight fan, even before I kind of got into this, was the win over Lesnar. Because I, I grew up as a big wrestling fan. Still to this day, I enjoy wrestling. Lesnar comes in. And, and you derail the biggest hype train, you know, that ever rolled through the UFC at that point, you know, with Lesnar. Um, what was the overall impact of that for you? And do you, do you consider that the biggest win or, or is it the championship wins that, that kind of resonate with you? No, I mean, it was a big impact, I think, just because it really like solidified that, you know, that fight, I think, was more, uh, more than just Lesnar and I. I think it was like pro wrestling versus MMA. Yeah, sure. And what would a seasoned top of the level pro, you know, professional wrestler do against a seasoned top of the level MMA fighter? And we saw, you know, uh, until Lesnar had more experience with MMA, you know, his pro wrestling or strength and power weren't alone just going to cut it. Uh, yeah. And so uh, uh, that's what that pretty much represents in my life and what I feel like I'm a part of more so than anything else. And and then on a personal note, my biggest fight's always been the second Noguera fight, just because yeah. you know. Uh, no one had submitted Noguera at that point. Yeah, you know, that's huge. Noguera, yeah, you know, to be able to finish who was the king of submissions at the time, you know, uh, you know, was a phenomenal feat for me. You know, I, I'm not happy that he had to have his arm fractured in so many different places. You know, I'm glad so I won by submission. So you did feel bad. So you did feel bad then. Well, no, and I said that earlier. <laughs> I feel bad for the situation. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Okay. just like a football player, you know, I'm going to try to take you out when I hit you. Yeah. Now, if they take you off the field on a stretcher, I'm not happy that you got. Yeah, it. and that's, you know what, I mean? that's like, what that's what I meant by that question. Oh you know? yeah, yeah. It's the, no, it's yeah, the no, aftermath. I don't, yeah, yeah. No, I don't wish ill harm on any of my opponents. Swear, but uh, but then again, it's one of those things where, like, you know, yeah, it's the football player. Do you feel bad you hit him? You're like, well, no, I feel bad yeah. he got hurt, but I didn't feel bad I hit him. So I guess that's a hard thing to kind of you know convey to people. It's like, do the people ask me, do you feel bad you broke the person's arm? I'm like, no. Yeah. But do I feel bad their arm got broken? Yes. But sure. that's because it wasn't my responsibility to keep their arm from being broken. Yeah. You know, sticking with Lesnar just for a second, what, did, were you impressed with, obviously, you know, he came back, he got the win over you, uh, and he went on to get a, a couple of wins. You know, he had a pretty awesome UFC career considering. Um, yeah. what, what, do you, what do you think about his evolution and maybe lack of evolution as, as he went through his stay in the UFC? Uh, what do you make of his career just in general? Well, I think that Lesnar, when he was able to, you know, was very smart. I mean, he was somebody who, you know, phenomenal collegiate wrestler, you yeah. know, a national champ. And when he stuck to that, he won fights. I think when he tried to be a striker or work other aspects of his game, he just yeah. didn't have the same amount of success. And, uh, you know, just not everybody's great at everything, you know, just, uh, you know, you saw in his very last fight after he came back out of retirement from the loss to a, uh, over him then he you know he came back and he you know he fought mark hunt and he did a great job i think he might have thrown you know two punches on his feet in 15 minutes but yeah. he shot took him down and stayed on top and, and wrestled uh, uh you know uh hunt for 15 minutes which defeated him and he stuck to his strengths and and i think that even lesnar now at 42 if he wanted to go into the ufc and just if he stuck to his strengths that way then he's always gonna be a pain in the ass for anybody to fight yeah, everybody still talks about the the trilogy fight, man. Uh, do you feel like there's still that that glimmer of hope that that comes to fruition somewhere, even if it's not in the UFC, if it's in if it's in Bellator, or if it's somewhere else? Do you think that there's a chance that fight happens still? I mean, it could possibly. Um, I, I there's don't. Still, the you know, interest. I think. I think people would. It would. Well, do crazy. It's Lesnar. I think Lesnar. You know, obviously, he's one of the biggest draws we've ever had in MMA. He's still the biggest heavyweight draw. I mean, he's really only second to Conor McGregor as far as uh, selling potential of MMA fighters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it'd definitely be interesting. We'll definitely look into that. You, you go to Bellator, um, a couple of fights in Bellator. I, I don't know that you were too terribly uh, happy with the way that went. And you're not, cur are you, you're not currently signed there right now, nope. from what I understand, right? So, I mean, wh what's the future look like for you? I mean, I'm sure kind of taking all offers at this point. Is there a place you'd like to go? Uh, an opponent you'd like to face? Like, what's the future for Frank Mir here? Well, I mean, right now, I just got done doing a lot of uh, 
I went down to Columbia in December and did a company named BioAccelerator, same place that Hughes and uh, Liddell yeah. went. And uh, man, it's changed my body. I've gone from somebody, I mean, for the last three or four years of my career, you probably could tell through my physique, I had stopped lifting weights. Uh, you know, I would do it very sparingly and just, you know, it was so painful. And uh, it got to the point where I was really after the uh, Roy Nelson fight in, uh, in, in October, even though I was victorious, I was like, man, I just don't think I could do this anymore. I'm in so much pain on a daily basis. Yeah. And then uh, when I went ahead and did the treatment and, you know, it wasn't a miracle. It wasn't overnight as far as, you know, you know a month later, did I feel great. And it's been real stringent with me following rehab. I've been training a lot, again, with strength training and, uh, and, and really pushing my body. And now I'm setting PRs and lifts and, and height of jumping over boxes that I haven't done in 15, 20 years. Uh, yeah. and, and actually, again, the PRs, I've never done them in my lifetime. And so uh, I feel really awesome. And so just, you know, my daughter now is picking up her career is wanting to fight. She just turned 17, so obviously turning pro here is going to be around the corner real soon. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know. It's inspiring to go to the gym every day with my kids and train. And just We all come home. We all share the same life. And, um, you know, it's great. So I just want to keep competing. I don't see any reason why not to if I'm able to go out there and fight. And I'm lucky enough that there's not a lot of heavyweights in the world that are worth anything, oh, you know. That's true. Yeah, uh, there's know, always going to be a fight out there for you. 100%. Yeah. You're right. And so yeah. I like competing. I like pushing myself. I like for a reason to go to the gym and add weight on the bar or try to do an extra round or, or you know, just that's just me it's just what drives me and gets me up if uh you know if that taken away i just i don't know whether identity to have yeah obviously you've been around the world you're with uh acb aca um for quite a long time doing commentary you and i travel to a lot of the same places and um is that something that maybe you could see happening maybe getting with one of those international organizations because they love heavyweights all over the world especially uh when you get into eastern europe and you talk about you know, Russia, and you talk about Asia, like they love bringing heavyweights in. Uh, is that something you would be willing to do? Maybe going to, for a one-off oh, yeah. and, yeah, maybe going to Japan, maybe getting that Japan fight? I mean. It's always been on the bucket list to fight in Japan, so yeah. Yeah, awesome. You know, I, I really excited to see where you end up landing and uh, seeing you get back into a cage or in a ring. Speaking of ring, before we get out, I got to ask about the wrestling experience. Uh, Josh Barnett's blood sport. You get in there with Tan the Beast Severn. Uh, I happened to be there uh, that week, and I didn't get a chance to be there because I was doing studio shows. But um, just tell me about that experience, man, getting in there and getting in front of a bunch of wrestling fans and just everything that went with it. Oh, I like it. And I, and I very much uh, can, you know, people always ask me, like, how can you do a pro wrestling when it's, it's not real? I'm all, well, I mean, I watch fighters do movies, and that's not real. Sure. You don't think John Wick's really shooting everybody, do you? I mean, <laughs> Keanu Reeves hasn't lost his mind. He'd be the number one murderer, you know, he'd be in prison. Uh, you know, it, but it's a part of martial arts. It's entertainment, and, uh, and it conveys that. And that's why I really like doing that aspect of it, because not that, uh, you know, some of the pro wrestling stuff is very flamboyant and unrealistic, and like, well, in a real altercation, that has sure. less than a zero chance of working. Uh, but I think just like we're starting to watch some of the action movies that have come out now, we see guys do things that obviously that's peak performance, perfect conditions, a guy hitting 33 pointers in a row. That's not an easy feat, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But it is plausible. It is within the realms of possibility, you know, because doing one three pointer is extremely plausible. You know, the way that John Wick drew his firearm, the way he moved and maneuvers and hit, obviously every maneuver was realistic in what he, a human could do. Now, obviously, doing it for two hours without making a mistake against 50 people, that's where the uh, realm of, okay, this is entertainment. But I feel, still find that entertaining. And so that's what I wanted to bring to whenever I do pro wrestling. is like, hey, look, any maneuver that I'm going to use is a real move. It's something that would actually be applied and worked. And then, you know, obviously, there's the entertainment value of acting, you know, around it. But as far as the core fundamentals of what techniques are used, they're real. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'd love to see you do it again. Did you feel comfortable in there? I mean, just obviously yeah. it is, it's, it's a different type of thing. Like I said, you, it is choreographed. You kind of know what's going to happen. But Dan Severn, obviously an incredible professional. Oh. That guy has to be easy to work with. The guy is just Super awesome. easy. It was funny. Because, uh, you know, we get there. Like, hey, Dan, how's it going, Matt? Cool. He goes, hey, let's go in the room. We'll talk. So, you know, we, we sit down. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So we're going to, you know, they, they want us to do X, Y, and Z. He's all. <laughs> we're gonna do this i'm like 
I'm like, all right, buddy, this is your world. I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, you take the lead. You're the lead dance partner. Tell me what's going on. You know what I mean? He's all, no. And, and I've always kind of lived by the, uh, the, uh, the old adage of, uh, you know, it's better to, uh, you know, beg for forgiveness and ask for permission, you know? Sure. Because uh, it's like, oh, all right, I'm in. So <laughs> He's an interesting character, man. One, one of my favorite people in the sport by far. That guy is just a straight businessman, 100%, dude. Uh, Dan Severn is. But, uh, well, I'll tell you, man, it, it, it was awesome. I, I, two quick fire questions. Um, first one, uh, I had a viewer ask me, did you have a beer with Brock Lesnar? Uh, after your fight, did, did you guys are you guys cool with each other? Like, because hey, things kind of got a little chippy there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, obviously it's very competitive, uh, but um, we're just kind of different guys, anyways. I think, yeah, that, yeah. you know, we're just if you look at our political views and our social views, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Okay, all right, so so no, all right, uh, <laughs> and then the second question. Um, so on this network here on MediaCom, we have a show called North Star Combat. Uh, Stefan Bonner and I do commentary, and uh, the promoter Dean Lamb, he's doing a show in Alexandria, which is Lesnar's hometown in Minnesota, and wants to know if you want to be a part of it, do some commentary, make an appearance right there in Brock Lesnar's hometown. Yeah, sounds like a good deal. When's it going to be? Uh, I believe it's going to be closer to summer. I think it's going to be closer to summer next year uh, once things have oh. cleared up a little bit. But uh, he yeah, wants just to let bring me know you as it gets closer. We'll talk. Yeah, absolutely. maybe you we'll maybe number. we'll draw Brock Lesnar from his homestead if he knows you're in town. <laughs> <laughs> Pull the bear we'll, from the woods. We'll make the third fight in North Star Combat in Minnesota. God, who knows? Uh, Frank, amazing. Thank you so much for giving me the time, and uh, I wish you well, man. Stay safe out there. Oh. Yeah, sorry, it was good talking to you, man. I miss you, man. All right. Absolutely. And that was Frank Mir, folks. Don't go anywhere. We got Chris Cyborg coming at you after the break. This is In This Corner.